I really appreciate everyone coming out here in the cold. Didn't have to. But, <laughs> but I do see uh, a lot of familiar faces, not too many unfamiliar faces. And maybe some of you guys are here to show us some support. Or maybe you're here looking for support. Or maybe you're just here just to help share this space. Either way, it doesn't make a difference to me because I appreciate you being here. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Cliff Sherrier. And I would like to welcome you guys to Lake Harriet Spiritual Community. Now, Lake Harriet is the neighborhood of this particular gathering place. Some of you call it home, while others like myself, we come from all over. And together, collectively, what we form is a community, a fellowship with inclusivity for all. I capitalize every letter in the, in the word welcome because we want you guys to just to come exactly as you are. Matter of fact, it's encouraged. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is or what country you or your, your ancestral lineage comes from, what your beliefs are. Like I said, it, you are welcome. It doesn't matter if you're a male or a female, or maybe you're a male that identifies as a female, or a female that identifies as a male, or if you're trans, queer, gay or straight, doesn't matter. Because like I said, it's encouraged for you to come exactly as you are. Because here in this community, we see everybody as the sons and as the daughters of the most high. And the most high meaning that ever present omnipresence that is everywhere, everything, and in everyone. Whether you call it God, the universe, great spirit, it's represented in, in many different ways. But what am I what I'm talking about? is that universal presence. That's what I'm speaking of. But here's my disclaimer, because I'm not trying to offend anybody or take anything away from anyone's belief structure. And though I do find there to be a lot of wisdom and truth embedded in a, in a variety of different religions, it is my own observation that I find that in certain ways that it's being taught and the systems behind it are often corrupted with hypocrisy, with deception and lies, falsehoods. Maybe it's for power. Maybe it's for control. And maybe it's just a, an honest misinterpretation or a, or a misunderstanding. I don't know. But for example, like, I don't necessarily believe that, that God is, a, is an old white man with a long gray beard, the way he's portrayed, sitting up in the clouds, beyond a, a set of pearly gates, waiting for an individual's life to expire here, to decide whether or not that they get to enter, enter the, the kingdom of heaven, or if they're going to burn in hell. Now, I'm cherry picking a little there, but you know what I mean. Because see, God is not plagued with the same mental, emotional, and moral issues as, as we humans. When the scriptures say that, that, that you were made in the image and likeness of God, they weren't talking about just because uh, you and I can get angry, that... That must mean that God gets angry. Or that for the fact that you and I may be able to, to be judgmental, that must mean that God must be able to be judgmental. That's reversing it. That's making, that's making God in the, in the likeness of us. God doesn't play favoritisms. God doesn't have chosen people. We are all God's chosen people. 
See, religious doctrine sometimes has the ability to, to set the framework for separatism and exclusivity rather than that inclusivity. I don't personally believe that there is one particular set of instructions or rules or a particular affiliation that, that grants you exclusive access to God. This is why the, we are not a, a religious community. And I, I'm not saying that there is anything wrong with religion. I'm only, I'm only implying that we don't believe it to be the end all. The final way or the only say. Instead, I see it as a, as a potential starting point, a jump off point that allows us to dive into the, into the spiritual essence of all that you are. We call this a, a spiritual community because we believe that the ancient teachings and the scriptures combined with the findings of, of modern science and the, and the unfathomable uh, phenomenon that we even exist here in the first place, all point us in the direction of an awareness. And at the very minimum, that there is a, uh, a mysticism to it all. And embedded in that mysticism is a majesticness in every direction, and it has infinite depths of perfection. What we see when we look at just what's in our observable universe is, is something eternal, something magical, something saturated with so much creativity that it undoubtedly deserves the exploration and the contemplation of our connectedness and our oneness with it all. It is in the, in the search for answers to the, to the inner questions that we ask ourselves, even the act of just wondering the thoughts. Is there something more to this? Is there something greater than myself? Is itself spiritual in nature? Because spirituality is about growth, both personally and collectively. It's about change, transformation, transcendence, and it's about possibility and discovery. These are the traits, the habits, and the actions that, that human beings have been utilizing the entire existence of our species. But it is only when we, when we implement conscious thinking, conscious questioning, and conscious intentions that these tools allow us to go beyond the surface to go beyond the known into the unknown. It's in this realm where realization reveals itself. And it's, it reveals itself uniquely to you because you are uniqueness in itself. It's not a truth. It's not the truth, it's your truth. This isn't a, a, a 2,000 year old, one size fits all hand-me-down. This, this is a personal, tailor-made, one of a kind, designed for a one of a kind. And the more of us that, that have this, this realization about our oneness with God, the universe, the presence, nature, whatever it is that you wish to call it, the more that we realize it, the more healthier and meaningful and purpose-filled our individual lives become. 
And, the, and when we begin to display these qualities and these traits that I just mentioned, that means that we have, we have tuned ourselves in to a particular vibratory frequency that has the power to take us to our ultimate potential. Now, this isn't just, just fluff talk. This isn't, this isn't new age BS. This is, this is stuff that people get a, a BS in, a Bachelor of Science in, a PhD in. Because it is proved that everything in the universe is, is, is energy. And not just energy, energy in motion, things that are vibrating. And if you look at anything under a strong enough microscope or under a, a, a scientific instrument, what you see is that everything is moving and that nothing is in a permanent state. But rather, everything has change and fluidity. And this isn't, this isn't new news. This isn't a, a new discovery. This is, this is validity. This is confirmation of what our ancestral brothers and sisters have been, have been trying to explain to us by leaving a, a trail of breadcrumbs. And I'm not saying that they had it uh, 100% right. And I'm not saying that, that we have it 100% right or complete understanding of it. But what I am trying to express and what I am trying to convey is what they left behind was symbolic in nature. It was a hand gesture that was pointing us in, a, in the right direction of awareness that itself was spiritual in nature. Which, which leads me to the, to the theme of the month here, which is the theme all month long here at Lake Harriet Spiritual Community, which is the courage to be vulnerable. Because the question that comes to mind while I'm having conversations with my heart is, do I have the courage to be vulnerable enough to explore something new? Something different? Something that, that personally resonates with me? Something that, that might be ridiculed by the masses because it's not taught at the masses. The courage to be vulnerable. There's, there's power in vulnerability. I know that on the surface that it may not always seem that way, but we have to remember that our, our world produces things from a place of duality so that everything can be balanced in harmony. Vulnerability has the ability to create authenticity. I'm going to say that again. Vulnerability has the ability to create authenticity. I'm going to get a little, little deep here just Stay with me, though. Now, it is a fact that we all were born. And it is also a fact that we all are going to die. Where we were before and where we go after is actually irrelevant here in this now. Because this, this is where you are right now. And you will not be here forever. At least not in this form, in this incarnation, in this particular life. We come and we go with the sun and the moon. Do we have the courage to be vulnerable enough to swallow that pill. To actually accept that fate. 
and that death is actually the only real guarantee that we have left in this life. But death, death is not an end all. It's just a, a state of change. But, but when I bring it front and center to my awareness and I think about it, it creates more meaning and more purpose to this life. Because if, if this is all we got, this is it, and we can't buy more time because it's not for sale. So if this is it, we should all try to live a life with as much authenticity as we possibly can. Because there will never, ever be another you. Now being vulnerable has kind of gotten a bad rap. Because in the animal kingdom, we have prey and we have predators. And predators, they thrive on the vulnerability of others. While a gazelle grazes on grass, the lion sits and waits. It waits for that, the gazelle to be at its most vulnerable. And it pounces. Yeah, eats that, eats that gazelle. <laughs> and then while the lion sits there, the full belly, man, man hunts that lion, kills that lion. Then we have this, this sickening reality that, that man kills man. Now, now, one can make the argument that perhaps that we are biologically hardwired to fear being vulnerable. But I say, good thing that we are not our, our biological bodies. You have a body, but you are not the body. You have a mind, but you are not the mind. What you are is soul. You are a, a spiritual being. You are a, an emanation of God, a divine spark, and, a, and, a, and an expression of divine creativity. You are spirit. And you were sent here to incarnate, animate, these protons, these atoms and cells to be a rose that grows from the concrete. And what you brought with you was a package, a unique gift that only you can deliver. You are not here in this, in this place, in this particular time and space by mere chance. You are here on purpose and with a purpose. You are the living, breathing manifestation of possibility. And you are here to do something that only you can do. If you are still breathing, and if you are still beating, that means that you are still in bloom. And it means that you are not too old and that you are not too young. It just means that the, the best of you is still yet to come. You are not here right now by mistake. You did not just appear to disappear in the history. You are here right now to be part of history. You are here to play a, a participatory role in the age of the sacred feminine. And what does he mean? Let me try to elaborate on this a little bit. 
So for far too long, we have lived in a world that has been battling a cancer. A cancer that, that, that went untreated and ignored for a long time which resulted in the, in the growth and the spread of humanity-crimpling tumors, which affected our world globally. And I am speaking metaphorically, but I am talking about real-life illnesses, real-life sicknesses, real-life diseases, like the disease of hatred, Bigotry, racism. These are real diseases, along with sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, anti-Semitism. These were the, the ailments and the open and infected wounds of a sick and dying world. And even though that we still see uh, these diseases in our, in our present world, the old world that created a, a thriving atmosphere and a thriving habitat for these diseases is dead. It's died and it's deceased. And we are here during this, this historical place in space and time, we are here for the birth of a new world, a new paradigm that brings with it the light of a new day. I know that at, at first glance, that on the surface, that you can look around and you can say that these sicknesses and these illnesses are still relevant and alive today. And that we still are seeing injustices and that we are more divided than ever. But it is in which lens of perception did you decide to, to look at things with? Would you choose to see it with? Is it a glass half full or is it a glass half empty? Like I said, we are in the, the age of the sacred feminine, which is giving birth to a new world. And I'm sure that some of you mothers in here, you guys could testify that while, while bringing in, while in labor and bringing in new life, bringing in something so beautiful that there are, that there are birthing pains involved with it. It didn't come without them. And yes, we have a long way to go. But this time, this time around, it's not going to go untreated. It's not going to go ignored because we have remedies now. We have cures for this, for this cancer, largely in part to individual souls who, who work collectively and brought forth their, their, their inner gifts that I was speaking about, who, who became the, the sacrificial lambs and transcended themselves into the antibodies and into the cells, white blood cells that we needed to, to fight off this deadly infection that was affecting our world. They came in incarnated as, as individuals such as Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, the Dalai Lama, Dr. King, Malcolm X, Mother Teresa, Pope John Paul. This list goes on and on. Many of the names that we know and many of the names that, that we don't know. Some that have passed on and there are many that are still alive today, still keep going. We have to be able to change our perception. We can't, we can't believe everything that we, that we see and hear in the news. Because the news, the news wants us to live in a state of fear, in a state of worry. They want us to believe that we live in a state of not enoughness or too muchness. Science is now able to calculate the rate at which our, our universe is expanding. And we are part of that expansion. We are participating in it. 
So as a result, we are evolving as a species. And what is happening right now is that, is that people, people are waking up. All over the world, every day, people are waking up. And they're seeing the racism. They're, saying, they're seeing the injustices. They're seeing the, the, the ecological devastation from our deforestation and the, and the pillars and the, and, the, and the plunder that we've been doing to our, to our natural world, our Mother Earth's natural resources. And they're waking up and they're standing up and they're doing it in protest. And they're saying that we're not going to take it. And that we're tired of it. We're tired of the deception. We're tired of the lies. And we want it to end and we want it to end now. That's what we're hearing. That's what I'm seeing. That's the news that I'm, that I'm tuning myself into. But do we have the courage to be vulnerable enough to believe it so? To believe in making the impossible possible. Within us all, is the kingdom of heaven. And all of us have the ability to play a participatory role in bringing heaven to earth. Because heaven is not a place. Heaven is not a destination. It is a presence that is never in absence. And it wants to be revealed through you as you. It's about, it's about merging our inner world, which is truth, with the outer world, which is illusion and lies. Freedom for all, freedom for all is the motivation and the inspiration behind the fight. It's what keeps us forging ahead. But it starts by stopping. We need to stop listening to the lies and to the, and to the small-minded thoughts and opin- opinions of others. If they're, not, if they're not lifting you up, instead if they are holding you down, then you need to stop, drop, and move on. Because in 2021 and beyond, we are about progress not regress. Like I said, we are, we are forging ahead. But more importantly, what we need to stop doing is believing the lies that we tell ourselves. Because we lie, we lie, we lie like a dog to ourselves. And it needs to stop. The sentence, I can't, is both dangerous and destructive. We need to be able to be honest with ourselves and be able to ask ourselves, are these thoughts, are these beliefs, are these lies, are they helping or are they hindering? Because if they're not, then we need to stop, drop, and move on. Stop listening and believe in the lies. There's a saying that I like so much, and it goes, I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. I'll say that one more time. I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. Let that one sink in. Remember, vulnerability leads to authenticity. There's only one you, and there will only ever be one you. Don't be somebody else's idea of you. If someone ever told you that there's something wrong with the color of your skin, 
They lie to you. If someone ever told you there's something wrong with, with how you love or who you love, they lie to you. If someone ever told you that there's something wrong with your, with your gender, gender identity or your sexual orientation, they lie to you. If someone ever told you that you're not good enough or if you're not smart enough, they lie to you. If somebody ever told you that you're too skinny or you're too fat, they lie to you. If someone ever told you that you're too ugly or you're too poor or if there's something that you can't do, they lie to you. And if you ever believed any of it for a minute, then you lie to yourself. And if that's the case, you need to stop, drop, and move on. And wake up. And awaken into the, into the, into the realization, into the knowing, into the awareness that you are a luminous being. An emanation of that presence and a package of possibility and potential. And if you are hearing me, or if you're really, really feeling me, then you are already awakening. And then it's time to, to rise and shine and spread that light. Because there's work that needs to be done. All across this globe, there are people of every race, color, and creed that are waking up. And they're acting as, as the midwives, surrendering their wisdom, their talents, their gifts, all in the effort to help usher in the birth of this new world. There's a, there's a fictional story that reminds me of this awakening. And it's, it's in the literary work of, of author Lyman Frank Baum who wrote the, the, the wonderful Wizard of Oz. But it's, it's through my lens that I see it as a, as a story of an awakening. The main character, of course, is Dorothy, who is a, an average person living, a, living an average life, just like you and I. And we can see a lot of ourselves in Dorothy because she represents uh, qualities within us like purity, innocence, nobility. And the story, story basically begins one day out of the blue, on a normal day, that, a, that a, an invisible force of energy comes. And it comes in the formation of a spiral, which then later manifests itself into a tornado. And Dorothy, of course, she tries to, tries to run and hide from it and seek shelter. But that, that tornado was on a collision course with Dorothy that was destined to happen. And eventually, it got a hold of her house and it spun her around and it threw her about until eventually she just got a good whack on the head and it put her out. And when she came to and she steps outside, she realizes that she has awoken to a new world. She has that famous line that says, I don't think that we're in Kansas anymore. It's because she, she, she doesn't recognize her surroundings any longer. But, it, but soon enough, she is greeted by Glenda the Good Witch and a bunch of munchkins. And they're greeting her in a, in a celebratory fashion, right? Because her house has landed on, on the Wicked Witch of the East. Now, we can see that, that first death scene as symbolizing the death of her ego. And that we can look at Glenda and the Munchkins as, a, as the forces of good in the world that want to that wanna help that want to champion you, that want to 
take you to where you want to go. And so Glenda and the, and the munchkins, they, they, they give her a set of instructions. And they tell her to, to follow the yellow brick road all the way to the Emerald City. And there, there is a wizard there that can help you, help you get home. But we know now that the, the death of her ego was actually only the beginning of her journey. Because she must follow this, this yellow brick road, the road to gold, and follow it all the way to the Emerald City, that city of green, where she will find a wizard, a prophet, that can get her home. This represents money. And the idea that if we, we follow it long enough, and eventually it will lead us to a solution that could solve all of our problems. So, so as she goes along her journey, she comes across a, a scarecrow in distress. And the, and the crows are, are picking at him. And that scarecrow, what the scarecrow represents is agriculture. It represents our, our natural world. And what does a scarecrow need? It needs brains. What is that telling us? That represents that we, need, that we need more thought involved in it. That we need to be smarter. That we need to think about what we're doing to our natural world. She informs them that she's headed to the, to the Emerald City. And that there's a wizard there that could possibly help him get some brains. So she proceeds to, to cut him down off his crucifix but he's been stuck there for so long that he doesn't even remember how to walk. But eventually he, he gets his straw together, you know, and they, they, they take off and they continue on their journey. But it's not long before they, they come across another character, which is a tin man. And that tin man represents that man-made industry, which is, which is frozen in time been stuck there for such a long time and that it's begging and it's, it's pleading for change and it's oil, oil. And she gives him what he asked for and it frees him. And what they learn is that that tin man is in, is in search of a heart because all of the, all of the consumerism with no heart is self-destructive, is damaging to everything. So again, she shares this idea with them that, that perhaps this, this city of green can help you get a heart. So the tin man joins, joins them on their journey. And as they, as they continue on, they're singing and they're skipping. They come across, they meet a lion Master of beasts, king of the jungle. And that, that king of the jungle, that lion, that represents man, human beings, top of the food chain, the most dominant species on this earth. But it too is missing something. It lacks courage. And so this lion, this king of the earth, is living a, a life full of fear, worry, and doubt. Doesn't have what it takes to, to stand up for itself, to do what's right. And this isn't a good thing. So Dorothy, Dorothy invites them along. And the four of them, they set out and continue on the path to the city of green with the high hopes of enhancing their, their current circumstances. But their journey, their journey continues to get more difficult for them because they're being haunted and tormented and threatened by, by the wicked witch of the West. And that witch, what she represents, are the forces of evil in the world. Those forces of evil that are, that are trying to prevent everything from being good. Try to prevent them from obtaining the qualities that they're after. She 
she's consistently trying to slow them, slow them down, slow down their progress because she doesn't want to see a world with a heart, with brains, with courage. And she definitely doesn't want to let Dorothy get home. She used spells, lies, deception, but to no avail because they were able to forge ahead and eventually they were able to reach that city of green. But it wasn't long before that, that sense of achievement and accomplishment was, was overshadowed and met with disappointment because before this, this wizard, this prophet would grant them what they wanted, their request, it wanted something in exchange. What he wanted was that witch's broom. And this, this represents the greed and the idea that, that nothing in life is free. And despite the risks and despite the sacrifices, that you still have to pay that man. But this, but this transaction forced and set the stage for a, a final showdown between the forces evil and Dorothy and her, and her new allies. And even though that they were outnumbered by a bunch of misled monkeys, I'm going to let you guys use your imagination on what that represents. But they were able to work together collectively with each one of them displaying the qualities and the traits that they believed they were missing, that they believed that they were in lack of. And this resulted in triumph, resulted in victory, because they defeated that witch, and they came into possession of the collateral that they needed. And when they returned to the wizard and presented the broom... That wizard had nothing for them. Came up short. And what this revealed is that, is that some things are just too good to be true. And it represents the truth that money can't buy everything. But what it also reveals is that there are lessons in disappointment, that there are lessons in the setbacks of life. And there, there was a, a silver lining in it all because it was able, they were able to, to pull back that curtain, which represents the removal of a veil, the clearing of the smoke, so that, so that we could see things the way that they truly are. That wizard, that wizard was a false prophet. And in the end, he had nothing of real value except a reminder that the brains, the heart, the courage, it was actually never in absence. It was just a reminder that it was, that it was camouflaged from our perception, from our awareness, behind a, a big, thick wall of disbelief. And what this represents is the depths of our inner potential. But we still have Dorothy, who all along, she just wanted to get home. And home represents the true self. And as it turns out, that that magic, that power that she needed to wake herself up, to get home, she was already, already a surplus of. She was the magician, the wizard, the alchemist. She was operating the body temple, the vehicle that could take her home. And it was just within a few clicks of the heel, right? <laughs> and repeating the prayer out loud that there's no place like home, that there's no place like home, there's no place like home, which bears a familiar resemblance 
to the affirmation that I am, that I am, that I am, that I am. And she awoke. She looked around and she was, she was excited to share her dream with everybody around her. And she said that you were there and you were there and you were there. We all were there. Because we all have a role to play in the new world to come. One of my favorite songs is by an artist named Sam Cooke. And it's titled, A Change Is Gonna Come. Well, a change has come. The question is, will you have the courage to be vulnerable enough to be part of it? Let's dream together. And together, let's make dreams come true. My name is Cliff Sherrier, you guys. I appreciate you listening to me, and thank you. Real quick, I just want to say um, for, for those of you guys that came here and for those of you guys that are streaming, I know that COVID has been especially hard on a lot of different people, harder on some more than others, and a lot of different businesses. Um, but I know that it's been also hard on this particular organization and that there is a, a donation basket at the back of the room, and there's also a, a virtual donation basket. And if you, anybody's in the position to donate anything, that just helps this organization ensure that we can do this from, from time to come and that we don't become a victim of, of COVID-19. Help us keep the doors open, keep the lights on, keep the heat on. But that's, would be, anything would be greatly appreciated, you guys. Other than that, again, thank you guys. And if there's anything anybody wants to, to add to the space or anything you want me to elaborate on, feel free. Otherwise, thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys.